welcome to another The Remy Podcast with Remy and, as always, Lord Matthew. Hello. Good to, good to have you a, a second week uh, consecutively in a row. I'm, I'm trying to keep that streak alive. He is nothing but punctual. Um, so, on today's show, we wanted to talk a little bit about, we will get to it at the end, uh, the Hall of Fame voting and what that looks like. Um, those votes are going to be in on t- uh, Tuesday and announced. Uh, so we will get to that. We'll we'll have our weekly, you know, where in the world is Manny Machado uh, kind of update going on with his market and Harper. Uh, but first, sort of a rocky situation in New York. Yeah, it's ter- still bad. <laughs> he is just shaking his head in, in <laughs> amazement of my, my punnetry. Um, Yankees making some moves over the past uh, week and a half or so. Um, actually, longer than that you know they got uh, we did discuss when they acquired Troy Tulowitzki for you know pennies on the dollar basically league minimum for the year uh, they also went out and acquired uh, DJ LeMahieu for uh, you know two years 12 million a year um, probably not necessarily 100% but probably you know uh, seeing what's going on with Manny Machado they wanted to have sort of a flexible infield piece um, you know, one of the reasons why I was pushing for Machado was somebody who could, um, you know, get on base, somebody who was, you know, a consistent hitter. Uh, LeMahieu does not strike out a ton. He puts the ball in play. Uh, he was a gold glove second baseman, uh, so he, he does bring you uh, quality defense as well. Uh, they did tell him, he, he said recently, hey, uh, you know, they want me to bring a lot of gloves to spring training, so they're going to use him in a, in a, I guess, like a super u- uh, utility role. Uh, a Ben Zobrist type, as they say, right? That is that is the the going trend these days, I think. But uh, we'll we'll get a little bit in more on uh, Manny as well, and then the big news from this week: the Yankees signing Adam Ottavino, uh, three years, twenty seven million, so nine nine million a year for Ottavino. And one of my biggest concerns was, you know, last year he was incredible, you know, two point four three ERA. Uh, but he's never really had success before. He's been in the league for about 10 years, and this is the first time that Ottavino kind of brought it together. Uh, he accredits to being able to work out, uh, you know, in New York City, you know, before spring training last year. Uh, he was looking for a space to work out in. His, his buddy, Matt Harvey, didn't want to work out with him. And his father-in-law had some, I guess, like retail space, like some storefront space that was empty and said, you know, for four months I could, you know, let you use this rent-free. And he went out and got a bunch of, like, analytic machines and, like, pitch trackers and, like, all this stuff. Because, I mean, the, the guy last year, he throws, like, a straight-up Frisbee. His slider goes, like, all over the place. That is very true. It's, it's one of those, with relievers, it's always kind of a, like, you've taken a little bit of a gamble, especially on a three-year contract like that. Sometimes it pays off, sometimes it doesn't. But uh, he's definitely trending in the right direction. Um, like he said, he's got a nasty slider, which is, again, all the rage these days in, in the relief world. <laughs> Um, I mean, if he if he even shows semblances of, of what he did last year, I mean, he's going to be a good piece. You already have a good back in that bullpen, so it just bolsters that that much further. I mean, it's true, and I, I, I am somewhat uh, hesitant and somewhat scared for Gary Sanchez to catch that. Uh, he, he's not always very dependable when it comes to blocking balls in the dirt, and if you got a guy... Admittedly, he's a different look. You got a lot of hard throwers in the back of that bullpen. I mean, you got Chapman, you got Batonsis, you got Chad Green. Um, re-signing Britain's a nice look with that hard sinker that he throws. And then just to add an element of Ottavino, who just, you know, he's a New York native, he's a Brooklyn guy who's going to come in and, and, you know, throw that, that, that Frisbee slider. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice look. It's a nice look. Um, we're going to get a little bit further into the relief market momentarily just to kind of cap off of this Rocky Yankee situation. Um, I was on Twitter and uh, I heard that um, Andy Martino, who's uh, from SNY.TV, um, you know, as, as we're about to talk about Manny again in a second, uh, noticed the Yankees, the reason they're probably not all in, so to speak, I'm sure they still have some uh, peripheral interest, is Nolan Arenado is going to be a free agent next year. Uh, this may mean that the Rockies might trade him at some point during the season because you want to maximize whatever value you can for a guy. And Nolan Arenado arguably depends on who you ask. You know, you can watch MLB Network, and those guys were just talking about, you know, who are the top third basemen in the league right now. Uh, not on every list, but on mostly every list, uh, Nolan Arenado usually comes up as, as the, one of the best, if not the best, third baseman in the entire league. You know, 
he's known as a gamer. He's a gritty guy. He's a team guy. Uh, you know, say what you will about Manny. I mean, obviously he's skilled. He's a generational talent. But you know, attitude issues come up, or you know, what kind of personality does he have? Uh, that's not so much a a worry when you look at an Arenado. And I, I, that's certainly not a downgrade, especially if you're trying to get somebody for for third. That doesn't mean the Yankees are going to get him. This may not even you know pan out. It may just have the the you know the the shadows of a possible thing, but but you know nothing concrete yet. But uh, you know if you look at it, Arenado is a good piece to acquire. Oh, very true. And I think it's one of those guys where you know Manny gets all the publicity. Obviously, he's always in the media. Arenado, if he's a fantastic third baseman, it's almost like he flies under the radar at some points. Especially playing for the Rockies, they're not usually. You know, I mean, they had a, they had a couple the last couple of years have been pretty good, but you know, they're generally not considered like an elite powerhouse team or anything. And he's just doing his thing over in, in Colorado. So, I mean, I think you could get him for obviously much cheaper than Manny. I think he's got a higher ceiling because we don't really know. He's still very young. He's always in the conversation with like Chris Bryant and, and those kind of people, kind of the younger third baseman, sort of you know trending that position a little bit. So. Yeah, I mean, I if I could have either of them, I mean, that's obviously awesome. I mean, Aaron is definitely not a downgrade by any means. No, and then uh, just want to use this to kind of segue back into the the Manny Machado talks. The big sort of um, not necessarily issue or, or powder keg here, but there was a report going around that the White Sox offered Manny seven years, one hundred and seventy five million, which is obviously. Uh, way less than what anyone would anticipate. You know, people keep talking about him getting, you know, close to three hundred million, or you know, let's break it down further. You know, getting like thirty, thirty-five million a year, and that obviously comes way under that. And then um, Manny's agent uh, Dan Lozano is, you know, countering that in the media, saying that that's not a real thing, and you know, these reports are coming out basically to sort of uh, tamper with his market. And agents are responsible for damage control. And I will say this, you know, it, it is a two-way street in the media between, you know, what comes out, which may benefit a player, and what comes out, what benefits the team. And normally, uh, there's not usually, like, a war of words. I know in the past, you know, Scott Boris has mentioned, you know, his clients being worth more than this, that, and the other. And that's fine. It's, it's, it's part of the game, so to speak. But... It, what's interesting to me is there's just so much more talk about Machado in terms of what he's going to do and how long he's going to sign and how much money he's going to get. And we're getting closer and closer and closer and closer to spring training, you know, and you really want to have something done by then. But I just, you know, I, 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 I'm on the outside looking in. I, I have no sources. I have nothing, you know, to say that uh, I know one way or the other. But just, just from my observation, you know, I don't think his market is where he thought it would be. I think he cost himself greatly with his antics in the postseason. And people just are not as, as you know, giddy about handing out these huge mega deals anymore. We've seen what's happened with A-Rod's deal. We've seen what happened. We're seeing right now what's happening, you know, with Pujols' contract. And people just are not giving you, you know, these, these mega deals anymore. And, you know, from what it looks like, from, you know, the rumblings on Twitter, Manny's just trying to go where he gets the most money at this point, which... Uh, you know, it doesn't always work out that way. You you should go somewhere where you're getting paid extremely well and you have a chance to win. You know, I, I can't see him even, let's say for argument's sake, the White Sox do end up offering him the most money, but the Phillies or Yankees offer him something close. Do, do you want to sit there on a team that's not going to contend for two or three or four years when you, you know, you played for Baltimore for so long, and I'm not saying this to be der, uh, to be deriding or, 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 you know, overtly critical of Baltimore, but... You know, they were a losing team for most of his tenure there. You know, what do you want to do in that situation? I feel like in his position, too, like you see a lot of veteran players. You know, they sign these, you know, one, two-year deals to try to get a championship. They sign with the team for a little bit less than normal. Manny's still, you know, very much in his prime. So, I, I mean, he can't afford to join one of those teams that are in the rebuild in the hopes that, I mean, you saw, like, John Lester did something like that with the Cubs. You see a lot of these, you know, veterans come to the Cubs thinking that they're going to be building something great. Uh, the White Sox are trying to emulate that plan a little bit. So, I mean, I could maybe see that happening. But, I mean, if I were him, I'd be looking for more of a long-term deal with more incentives to, you know, you see those performance incentives for, you know, at-bats in a season or something like that. I'd want something long-term so that you were you were locked in, you weren't having to do this free agent marketing. Because who knows what will happen in the next, you know, four or five years. His 
performance that might dip a little bit, his value might go down if he gets back into free agency after a short deal. I mean, he's not going to he's going to kind of play himself out of, you know, that extra money he might get elsewhere. It's true, and there's also the, I think Scott Boris invented these type of contracts, these swell contracts, you know, there's some talk he might do that. And what those look like is, you know, let's say you sign a 7 or 8 year deal. Well, you have the option to opt out after, let's say, three years, or the team could opt you in for the rest of the deal but give you an accelerator and bump up your salary, you know, depending on how you played in that first three years or four years. So, I mean, that's something to consider as well, and that may bring more teams uh, coming in. Uh, there's allegedly one or two mystery teams being reported on Manny now, and that could be true. Um, I know the mystery team sort of uh, throwaway is something that you'll typically hear because – you know, an agent might say, oh, I have some other people who are interested in my client because they're trying to garner that interest and increase offers. Um, I would not be surprised if there is at least like one more team looking in on Manny. You know, it could be somebody surprising. It could be maybe maybe it's the Braves or somebody else, you know, that's really on the cusp of contention and, you know, would like another superstar or somebody to, to come in there. But I, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see how that pans out. Harper's Road, I think, is a little bit easier to see right now. Allegedly had a real good conversation last Saturday with the Phillies, and we know the Nationals are uh, were reported to be increasing their offer to him. So I think I think Harper's staying within the NL East. I think his, his uh, path is a little bit more clear than Machado's is at the moment. Sure. And you see all the people that the Nationals have that go through Boris, too. So they already have that relationship with them. They're used to his dealings or whatever you want to call it so yeah i can't see anybody outbidding especially with someone from you know he's been with washington his whole career i mean if they're going to try to outbid anybody it sounds like at this point yeah i think that that'll that'll um that may end up being a, a nice reunion um want to dip back for a second um you know we were talking about the yankees and the rockies earlier we we're talking about the yankees acquiring adam Modavino, and that kind of put a um a roster crunch on them. They have, they're at maximum capacity on their 40 man. Sonny Gray has been somebody that's been rumored to be on the move forever now. Uh, hashtag Gray Watch. Um, and apparently that's coming closer to fruition. Not fast enough for, for my tastes, but coming closer. Uh, it's being reported that the Reds are sort of um, ahead in those trade talks. They have uh, a couple prospects that might interest the Yankees. Uh, problem being that. Um, one of those prospects would still require a 40-man roster spot. And so there's been some interest, especially, you know, the Yankees have acquired Adovino, they re-signed Britain, uh, they have a pretty stacked bullpen, so somebody may have to go. Uh, Tommy Cannelly or Luis Sesa uh, seems to be the favorite in on that. Uh, I think that's probably what's holding up some of these deals, and I see a lot of people reporting that, you know, one of those names might be attached to Gray. I see no reason why one of those pieces couldn't move separately. You know, the Yankees have been having discussions with the A's, the Padres, the Braves, the Reds, the Giants. I'm sure there's some other guys out there on the peripheral. Uh, maybe some of the losers, and I don't mean like losers in a <laughs> negative way, but some of the losers of some of the other free agents, like uh, the Rangers were rumored to be heavily in on Adovino. So maybe uh, maybe a Canley could be a fit there. So I, I don't think, and this is, again, my speculation. I don't have a source or anything on this. But I don't think necessarily those moves have to be in the same piece. Um, but they definitely are, in my opinion, are going to move Gray by before this weekend lets out because they have to announce Adovino. So um, something's definitely going to go there. And it's interesting to see the Reds and the Padres um, sort of rumored in on that. Uh, Dennis Lynn of The Athletic was talking about how those teams were involved, talking to the Indians uh, about Corey Kluber. We've heard Corey Kluber might move all off season. And the thing that interests me the most is – you know, could the Padres try and acquire Kluber to flip him? The Padres are rumored to be enamored with uh, Miguel Andujar, and if there is, you know, a possibility for the Yankees to get Machado or, or you know, get uh, Arenado at some point, you know, this season, uh, that could make sense. I mean, the Yankees still, I think, really could use an ace, and the Padres, uh, to get a young impact position player, especially, you know, as they try and, you know, contend in that, uh, in that really sort of, I'd say close, but no one's really blowing you away, even though it's a close division out there in the NL West. I mean, the Dodgers seem to have a stranglehold on it, but nobody, nobody's running away, per se, with that division anytime soon. Oh, definitely not. I mean, kind of, I was saying earlier you know, about the Rockies not being a perennial elite team. I mean, they've been, obviously, they knocked the Cubs out last year. They made a, a nice playoff run there. Uh, the Giants will do giant things eventually, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, 
but yeah, I don't know. That, that that's a that's a tough thing to to read at. Um, I know the Reds specifically, obviously being in the NL Central, um, their I think their one biggest weakness was starting pitching. So any extra starters they get, even if they're you know fringe, you know third or fourth rotation guys, that'll bolster it that much more. And I mean they can you know hit like anybody. So that puts them you know in that very tough division, puts them in contention a little bit. Um, I, uh, the Padres flipping Kluber, I mean that that must hurt because that's the, that's a pitcher you actually hit well against. So it's one of the pitchers you do well. You're kind of taking them off the market a little bit. Well, if you <laughs> help us uh, make a run at the Red Sox, but uh, the relief market's been interesting. Uh, speaking of the Indians, Cody Allen just signed uh, the other day with the Angels, uh, one year, eight and a half million dollar deal. He had a rough season last year. He pitched to a point seven ERA. I mean, he used to be uh, considered, you know, one of the elite bullpen arms. I mean. He, he's had some good runs in him. I know he wanted an opportunity to be a closer, and I guess the Angels are going to give him that. And then the the only other major uh, bullpen arm left is uh, Craig Kimbrell. He's, he's the best option. I, I know he was looking for a six-year-plus deal. Uh, that was a little too rich for the Red Sox blood, allegedly. Uh, maybe maybe a reunion with the Braves could be a possibility. I mean, what what do you see on uh, for Craig Kimbrell? I, if the Braves don't give him that six or seven year deal, I think he goes back to the Red Sox. Honestly, he, I mean, they, obviously, Red Sox have a pretty solid team. The Yankees are obviously short up their bullpen. They're short up their team a little bit to compete. Um, I think he, you know, I think he'd have a good future in, in Boston. Honestly, so if I, unless the Braves give him this out of the world deal, I think the Red Sox make it work somehow and they they re-sign him. If I never have to see him do that weird chicken arm thing he does ever <laughs> again, I will be happy. Um, Moving on to the uh, the last topic, we've been talking about it for a couple weeks, and we're actually going to get into it now. Um, I looked at the Hall of Fame percentages. Like I said, uh, the voting will be announced Tuesday, but um, there's a guy on Twitter, Ryan Thibodeau, at not Mr. Tibbs, and that's T-I-B-B-S. Uh, he puts out uh, ballots. People send in their Hall of Fame voting ballots to him, and uh, he compiles a database and has the percentages and everything. So we're going to look at who's pretty much a lock and then some of the fringe guys that may or may not get in, and that's you know just a couple names. Um, at the time that I pulled that spreadsheet, it was about 45% were reported. Um, it's looking like right now uh, Mariano Rivera has 100% of the vote, um, Roy Halladay 94%, Edgar Martinez 91%, and Mike Mussina has about 82%. Uh, Kurt Schilling, Roger Clemens, and Barry Bonds, uh, those three names are sort of fringe. They were 73, 74%. You need 75% you need, uh, or higher uh, to, be, to, to, to get into the hall. So uh, what we're going to do right now is we're going to take a little bit of a look at the four names who are getting in, most likely, and then uh, out of the three borderline ones, uh, we'll have Matt and I kind of say which, one, which <laughs> ones uh, we like for the hall. Uh, but looking at number one, uh, all right, we, we know I'm a Yankees fan. I beat that into everybody's face left and right. But uh, bias aside, I have never in my life in, in almost any sport seen somebody's automatic at what they do as Mariano Rivera. Um, in 77 years, no one has ever had a unanimous uh, vote to get into the hall. Uh, Mariano Rivera leads, uh, leads closers all time with 652 regular season saves. He's won five World Series. He recorded the final outs in four of those. Uh, he has 96 postseason appearances, a .7 ERA, 42 saves in the postseason, 141 postseason innings, only giving up 11 runs. Uh, he's a 13-time All-Star. He was the 99 World Series MVP. Uh, he was a three-time MLB saves leader. I, I don't know what more you can say about a guy. I mean, you know, with the exception of, you know, a little bit of rough postseasons in 01 with the Diamondbacks in 04 against Boston, I mean, Mariano Rivera is as close to automatic as you could ever get in, in, in your life. Uh, he was respectable outside of the playing field. You know, people thought he was a good guy. I mean, that doesn't, you know, necessarily account for much with the Hall of Fame or else, you know, like Ty Cobb wouldn't be there. But... You know, as a, as a player, in terms of accomplishments, in terms of what your peers think of you, I, I don't know how there could be somebody who would be against Rivera. I know there was one um, there was one sports writer who refused to enter a ballot this year because he didn't want to put Rivera on it, and every single uh, writer said that that is mentally insane. 
um, you know, it, it's not. It ends up being a nice thing because it's not going to count against them as him not getting a vote because the guy's just abstaining from voting. Um, but anyone who followed the game, anyone who's in the game, anyone who watched him, anyone who played against him, uh, the accolades Mariano Rivera has is just it's it's the stuff of legends. He's like a video game character. But he's a closer. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I mean, you look at you look at when you think of the great closers in the game, you know, like Rod Beck, Dennis Eckersley, Lee Smith, all those like big names in the past. You think of those people that have actually gotten to the Hall of Fame, you compare those to Mario Rivera, and like you said, his accolades, you know, are the best, you know, if not close to the best in pretty much every category. Um, as you said, he was nearly automatic when he comes in. I mean, it was almost a guaranteed victory at that point once he entered the game. Um, I, the fact that you have these other closers in the Hall of Fame that have not matched nearly what he's done, I mean, I, I like you said, I don't think there's any debate, honestly. <laughs> no, it, it, and it, I think, you know, for me it's special because he's going to be the first unanimous. Uh, I mean, granted, obviously, you got a, a little hopefully. bit of hopefully. <laughs> Fingers crossed that he's going to uh, be the Kingerfie first. Jr. was really close, and even he didn't get unanimous, so that's no, going to be tough. It, it, it is, and I, I, you know, I loved Griffey too, but it, it would be nice. Uh, the next name on the list who's probably going to get in his, his first year on the ballot as well is uh, Doc Halliday, Roy Halliday, and you know before I go into his stats, I just want to talk about the eye test, and you know people laugh about you know the peripherals of something versus you know the actual hard numbers, and just looking at Roy Halliday, I remember you know him obviously being on the Blue Jays for many years, sure. and I would always be scared out of my mind when we were going to play him because. You know, it, it's so weird because his first year in the league, he was terrible. He had over a 10 ERA, and the Blue Jays sent him back to the minors to work on his mechanics. And then when he came back, he was just this this unhittable monster, basically. You know, watching him for so long in the AL, and then, you know, when he went to the, the National League with the Phillies and, you know, having to play him in the 09 World Series, the Yankees' strategy was literally beat everybody who was not Roy Halladay. You're going to get two <laughs> losses, so you better win the other games. Sure. That was the strategy is because he, he had so much respect. There was so much fear of him. Um, you know, in the National League, you know, you got to see him with, with the Cubs, and he, just what he was able to do was, was amazing. And that's, you know, besides the point that you know, he was a two-time Cy Young winner. Uh, he threw a postseason no-hitter. Uh, obviously, he won a World Series. He was an eight-time All-Star. He had uh, 200 wins and a career 3.38 ERA. I mean, th- th- I agree that he should be in the Hall of Fame. I don't. Th- I don't think there's any any questioning of the caliber of Roy Halladay. Well, when you look at like especially nowadays, uh, you know, the vi- the amount of victories like that's such a you know an obsolete stat these days now with the way that people use bullpens. And he was kind of right on the cusp of win. That sort of transition, though, we have these more long relievers. You have, you know, your setup men and everything. So victories are a little harder to come by nowadays anyway. Um, as you said, that the eye test is what really stands out. I mean, a postseason no-hitter is difficult to do. No-hitter is difficult to do anyway, but especially in the postseason. That whole postseason run was pretty ridiculous. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember... I, I'm trying to remember how the Cubs even fared against him. I'm sure it was not very well. We were kind of not good when he was pitching for the Phillies anyway, but... Um, I, I definitely remember his time with the Blue Jays, and that's when he started putting up those crazy numbers, and, and he had his best seasons, I think, with, with Toronto. And um, I mean, he was, you know, a stout pitcher back at that time. So, I mean, similar to, I mean, not obviously as dominant as Rivera was, but, I mean, during his time, he was an elite pitcher. He was one of the best. So Absolutely. And that's, uh, that's one thing that I think gets taken away, you know, when people are voting is they don't understand that it, it, it's – you know, I'm sure there's going to be people with better numbers than this, that, and the other, but it's during your your time period, were you one of the most dominant? Sure. And you can't take that away. And I think that this also comes into play on the next two people we're going to discuss. Uh, Edgar Martinez, uh, I think it's his last year on the ballot, and he's thankfully going to get in. Uh, he had a career 312 average, seven-time All-Star, five-time Silver Slugger, only DH to get a, a slash line of 310, 410, 510 or better. Um, he was one of 10 uh, DHs to uh, get, or players, I should say, to uh, have 300 plus home runs, 500 plus doubles, over 1,000 walks, over three over 300 batting average, and over a 400 uh, on base plus slugging. I mean, or I'm sorry, just on base percentage. I apologize. Um, 
you know, he, he, revolution, he revolutionized what a DH is. I mean, sure. Edgar Martinez was the prototypical designated hitter, and he was extremely successful. He was an offensive machine, and I know he wasn't necessarily as defensively savvy when he was in the field as anyone would have liked, but that's why he was a designated hitter. It is a prominent position in the league. Offense is key to, honestly, the league's success. And more so now than ever. <laughs> more. So you can't take that away. You can't take away, you know, what a position is and does. And Edgar Martinez, uh, I mean, I think up until David Ortiz over the past few years, I think Edgar Martinez is, is what you looked at from a DH. Sure. And, uh, you know, it's it's unparalleled really, what, like I said, until – you know, David Ortiz, but it's unparalleled what what he was capable of doing offensively. When well, you think back to like a similar to with Holiday with his time in Toronto, I always think of him with with the Mariners and like those those that one team that probably should have gone to the World Series and didn't. <laughs> but that was a crazy good offense. I mean, you think of all the players on that team. Martinez was almost overlooked to some degree because he had Griffey. You had. Um, I think the other guys. We like, had Richie Sexton. I think, think Buner was on that Jay team. Jay Buner, yeah. Yeah, that was a stacked team, and Martinez was was commonly overlooked. But he, like, like you said, he had 300 for a career is very difficult to do in, in the major league, especially, you know, with the way pitchers pitch now. Even you know when he was prominent in the, the 90s and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think he's another one that he's he's <laughs> had a struggle to get into there at this point. But I think I think. He's got a lot of traction the last few years. I think I think this is the year he finally gets in. It is. I mean, he, he's got a good percentage. He'll get in. And uh, lastly, on the likely to get in this year is is Mike Mussina. Moose. Uh, I I loved Mike Mussina uh, as a Yankee. I loved. I I feared him as an Oriole, and I sure. loved him as a Yankee. Two hundred and seventy career wins. Two thousand eight hundred and thirteen strikeouts. Five time All Star. Seven time Gold Glove winner at pitcher. Uh, since 19, since 1969, when the when the mound was lowered, his 270 wins were 11th best. His 638 winning percentage was 11th best. His 30 his 3,562 innings pitch was 21st. His ERA plus of 3.68 was ninth best. His uh, walks and hits uh, per nine innings was 1.19, which is good for 11th overall best. His uh, strikeouts of 2,813 were 14th best. His strikeout walk ratio of 3.58 is second best, and his wins above replacement at 82.9 is eighth best. I, I, the guy is a phenomenal, phenomenal pitcher, and I, I, I know he's getting towards the end here of the voting too, so I'm glad he's going to get in this year, but he, he deserved to get in. He didn't need to wait this long. Well, the things that stand out to me, um, obviously the seven-time gold gloves, that's very difficult to win at your position every year. Uh, and then kind of one of the last sets, that strikeout to walk ratio. I always think of, you know, when you think of gold gloves and, and K to walk ratio, you always think of Greg Maddox and how he would paint the corners and, and he just, he never walked anybody. He was always a contact hitter. Mussina obviously struck out more batters than Maddox did, but he just had full control over what he was doing. And that strikeout to walk ratio always stands out to me as someone who's got, even if they get hit sometimes every now and then they have a bad outing here or two, they have complete control over what they're doing. And that sort of exemplifies, you know, what he did. And not to mention, he, he was an amazing uh, New York Times crossword uh, puzzle player. What? He, he was known for uh, doing the New York Times uh, crossword puzzles. Very uh, very smart, does savvy that, guy. Does that get you in the, the Hall of Fame? It does not, but it is, an, <laughs> it is another tidbit about Moose that I could throw out there. Uh, I'll be really happy to see him get in. Uh, so, Matt, that leaves us with the three fringe guys this year who are probably not going to get in this year. Sure. But are... are you know, on the precipice there, on the edge there, with uh, with Schilling, with Bonds, and with Clemens. Out of those three, uh, who would you like to see get in, and why? That's tough. There's a couple couple Yankees guys in there. There's a couple Yankees guys <laughs> and, a, and a guy I do not respect as a human being. <laughs> um, to me, I mean, obviously all three of them have the controversy behind them. That's what's keeping them out for the most part. I don't see how you can keep, regardless of the steroid use or you know alleged use, alleged, or whatever you want to call, whatever you call it, whatever you want to call it, I still don't see how you can keep Barry Bonds out of the Hall of Fame because when he, hit, I mean, he's the all-time home run leader again, regardless of if there's an asterisk, whatever. During his time in the league, I mean, you can look at Clemens as being a feared strikeout pitcher. You can look at Schilling being the postseason guy. 
Bonds was as feared a hitter as any you could think of. I mean, he had, what was that one season? He had like a like five ten on base percentage or something. Because they walked him every five half ten. the time. He was on base. Like you don't see that as much anymore. I mean, Harper to some degree they walk him a lot, but he doesn't hit as well as Bonds ever did. I I don't see how you can keep Bonds out even with again the alleged steroid use or whatever you want to call it. Well, that's gonna that goes into for me Roger Clemens and yes because you know former Yankee guy who's you know one World Series guy who's known as a as a strikeout king, uh, you know maybe obviously with with steroids you know a good long career, uh, just to the to the same effect you know these guys were never never uh, never ha- never failed the drug test you go on you go on hearsay and I know the Mitchell report had fun in times with everybody. And I have no problem. I have no problem with there being a plaque or an asterisk next to their name saying these guys, while not confirmed, you know, did pitch in the midst of the steroid era, and and you know were suspected of this, that, or the other. But the Hall of Fame is a museum of a game. Baseball is a game. Baseball is monopoly. Baseball is tiddlywinks. Just because we put players on a higher platform, you know, because they play baseball or football or basketball or what have you, it is still a game at the end of the day. And these Hall of Fames are museums to explain to to upcoming generations and future generations of what the game looked like in certain periods of time. And to exclude uh, cornerstones of certain eras to me is ridiculous. I Like I said, I do not care what type of asterisks or what type of um, framing you use to have them there, but it's a joke to have to have these museums and not have these people there. When you have players, you, you think of like the dead ball era when you had pitchers that just, you know, Cy Young with his 500 wins. Like you're never, that record's never going to be broken, but there's a reason it's never going to be broken because the game was so different, you know, 100 years ago. Um, I, I would agree. I think even with like the alleged <laughs> steroid use, I mean, you didn't see anybody hitting like Bonds did. I mean, you saw, I mean, McGuire and Sosa had their chase or whatever, and I think you could kind of tell they were definitely doing something there. (laughs) Um, But even with everyone, I'm sure there's a lot more people that just weren't caught doing that kind of thing. You still didn't see people hitting and playing the game the way that Bonds did with, with the Pirates and then later the Giants, so... I, uh, I, I'm sure you don't care if Schilling ever gets in, but I, I, I don't. I have to look at the numbers, but Schilling. I mean, Schilling's had wonderful postseason performances, and I think that's why he's more in the discussion. I think his regular season numbers, and I, I would have to delve into them a little deeper, are very good. Um, he was still a fantastic pitcher. He I mean, was regular season and postseason, but. You're looking at the character side for sure. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> listen, you can you can be a total a jerk off and be in the Hall of Fame. You know, I, I, it's. It is what it is, you know. They can put Schilling in there and his bloody sock. I don't care, you know. It, it is, you know, whatever. Maybe just the bloody sock part. Just put At the least bloody... that was some, some historical, I guess, significance. I think that maybe. isn't I think that isn't actually in Cooperstown. I don't know. Is it? I think so. So, so his sock, but not him, would be in the... Oh, <laughs> him, no. But, um, no, it's, it's good discussions. And, um, you know, obviously there's still a lot more movement. Uh, I will throw this back not to... Um, I didn't want to ignore it, but we did kind of go past it. I do random Twitter polls here and there just to kind of gauge everybody's opinion of what's going on. And I did do a Twitter poll last week of how long would you sign Manny Machado? Seven years, eight years, nine years, or just sign Bryce Harper uh, instead? And 40% wanted a shorter deal. 40% wanted uh, Machado to do that seven-year deal. So uh, we're going to have to keep watching over the next week or two, maybe three. I don't know. See how it goes. And see where him and Harper land, but we will keep you informed. We will update any kind of deals. I'm hoping that Sonny Gray hasn't been, I do hope he's been traded, but for the record, I don't hate Sonny Gray. I just don't, you know, due to facts, he doesn't pitch well in New York. So change uh, of scenery. Yeah. Pickles, Pickles is an okay guy in my book. I just think that he needs to be a a terrible, that is his nickname. I did not give a terrible nickname, but uh, we will keep updating you on, uh, on everything. And, um, We'll, uh, we'll congratulate those next week after the uh, Hall of Fame uh, official votes have all been revealed. And uh, can, can we road trip to Cooperstown this year? Good. I've never been there. We should do that. But uh, There's some uh, Cubs players there. There's some Cubs players there. <laughs> if, we, if we do that, we'll take pictures and put that on the, on the, uh, on the old Facebook. But, um, yeah, we will, uh, we'll keep everybody informed of what's going on. We thank you guys uh, for listening, as always. This was a little bit longer of an episode than normal, just with all these facts and figures to have to be included. 
It's a was it some article said that it was a it was a an old man's sport because it's all the numbers and it's all like nerdy and sciencey and stuff. But I I am terrible at math. I was in remedial math. You read off those. The, you read off the numbers really well though. I do. I, I can read. I can't. I can't uh, uh, calculate. Numbers, they get confusing. Percentages and fractions of ratios the ratios and <laughs> I don't know. But uh, we thank you guys for listening to us. Uh, we'll be back next week. And uh, from the bottom of uh, Matt and I, the cockles of our heart, I think that's a good that's a good place to put to to ex- express feeling from the cockles of our heart. We thank you and always be a fan.